Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Produce Buzzers Podcast. We are so happy you have joined us today, and I think you will be too after the show is over, because you will learn a lot about fresh fruits and vegetables, how to select and store them, how to prepare and cook them, and surprising facts about their history and origin. We hope it inspires you to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables, not only for your health, but also for your delight and pleasure as you explore their amazing world of taste and delicious flavors. Eating more of them will transform your life in so many positive ways. So settle back, relax, and get ready for another delicious adventure with the Produce Buzzers. Greetings, fruit and veggie fans, and welcome to another episode of the Produce Buzzers podcast. I'm Edwin Stepp, your host and executive editor of Produce Buzz. I'm joined by Teresa Nolan, the founder and president of Produce Buzz, along with Rick Stepp and Cynthia Benedetto, both contributors to ProduceBuzz.com. We have a very special guest today who is creating a ruckus in healthcare. He is giving people control over their health and well-being with a mission to keep them off medications and out of the hospital. He's breaking new ground in the medical field and is the very first board-certified physician in a comprehensive and effective new treatment that includes, along with other healthy habits, eating lots of fruits and veggies. So that's why we're a fan of our guest today. We'll get into that in just a minute, but let me, t let me tell you a little bit about him. After 20 years as a cardiologist, our featured guest today took a big turn in his career when he had what he calls an epiphany. He came to realize at that time he had not been practicing health care, but instead sick care. And he took some dramatic steps to change that. Welcome, Dr. Brian Asbill, to the Produce Buzzers podcast. Dr. Asbill, thank you for joining us today. Can't wait to hear more about your story. Yeah, thanks, Edwin. I appreciate, <laughs> yeah. appreciate the opportunity to be here and appreciate the kind introduction. Yeah, great. Tell the listeners more about your epiphany. It was a kind of an interesting path, you know, for me. I, I grew up in South Carolina, in Columbia, South Carolina, um, where it wasn't a meal till there was a meat. You know, what are we going to have with the, was the question before every meal. What are we going to have with the chicken, with the steak, with the, whatever the meat happened to be. And I start, I came to Asheville in 2001 to start my cardiology career. And it's really interesting. I, I think we can probably all say the same thing. When you look back on your career and you wonder how in the world did I end up here? So I, I was a cardiologist, traditional cardiologist, and had treated, you know, hundreds of patients uh, with really what I, I thought was the best treatment strategy. I mean, we, we, were, we learned a lot of procedures in cardiology, heart catheterizations, ultrasounds, stress tests. We, we can do a lot of things to people, and we have a lot of, of pharmacologic treatments that we can offer patients, statins for their cholesterol, blood pressure medications, diabetes medications. You know, we've all been um, probably a patient at some time or another and can relate to what I'm saying. And things were going along quite well. And then, you know, over time, I realized that some of the patients that I had, what I had optimally managed with sort of a pills and procedures approach for their coronary artery disease, for example, we'd put in a stent when they had a heart attack, would come back several years later with another event, despite being optimally managed or what I felt like at the time was optimal management. And this question sort of arose for me, you know, what am I doing wrong? How come my patient keeps coming back for another stent and then a bypass surgery and then a stent of the bypass? And, you know, I had just a really interesting event uh, after about maybe eight or 10 years of cardiology practice I had a patient give me a book called uh, Prevent and Reverse Cardiac Disease by Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. 
And I read it and I thought, interesting. You know, it was the first I had ever considered a plant-based diet, a whole foods, and that's important. Maybe we can talk a bit more in detail about that later, a whole yeah. food plant-based diet. And I put it aside and then I had a patient come see me for a second opinion. He had had two bypass surgeries and it had been recommended to him that he have a third open heart coronary artery bypass grafting or cabbage, we call it for short, C-A-B-G, surgery mm -hmm. to reroute the blockage, reroute the uh, blockages in his heart artery so that he would no longer have angina, which is exertional chest pain that was really interrupting his quality of life. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it popped into my mind, I have this book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, that I can share with this patient. And I said, you know, you've had two of these surgeries. Why do we feel that the third time is going to be the charm here? You know, he's used the bypasses to do bypass surgery. You take veins out of the legs and plug them into the heart. You take arteries from various places, the forearms, the chest wall. And after two of these, you know, if you have five vessel bypass twice, you've used 10 grafts. So you're kind of running out of arteries and veins to use to, to be conduits to redirect the blood flow. And so he, it had been mentioned to him that he could use cadaver vein grafts, which um, he said, how many patients have you had who've had that done? And I said, at the time, I said two, and both of them had some relief of their symptoms, but neither one of them lived beyond about four years. Wow. Which is, you know, not a, um, you know, not the news you want to share with someone who's heard, okay, third time's going to be the charm. So I said, since your symptoms are stable, why don't you, why don't we try this change in diet and see what happens? If things, we have nothing to lose here. If things get worse, call me. And if it's an emergency, we, we do what we have to do. But if things are stable, let's give it three months and then let's see what happens. And this man was obviously very motivated because he was taking five nitroglycerin a day to just get through the day. He would actually take a nitroglycerin pill under the tongue preemptively before he would go walk the dog or something so as not to have any exertional chest pain. And that strategy worked okay, but five nitro a day seemed to him and to me both as sort of a band-aid approach for, for these symptoms and not the optimal solution. So off he went. And then I honestly sort of forgot about it. And he came back three months later and I actually remember, I, I, I vividly remember where I was standing in the office and I saw this man come past me and it, and I, I didn't realize who he was until he walked into the room with my medical assistant. And I thought, that's the guy that I gave that book to. I can't wait to go talk to him because he looked different. He looked um, more vital in some way. He looked pink and he was sort of ashen gray when I first saw him. And how, so how, he, how long had it been since you'd seen three him? Three months. Three months. Yeah. It had been three months, uh, which is, you know, not a long time. No, not at all. And and so I walked in to see him and I sat down. And I said, I have to tell you, you look like a different guy. So can you tell me about your experience? And he's big smile on his face, which was not present three months prior. And he said, Doc, I have um, I have lost 27 pounds in three months, which was a good thing, but not our goal. Of course, that's not what I was focusing on at all initially when we spoke my cholesterol has dropped a hundred points and he gave me his cholesterol readings. I was also a lipidologist at the time. So I was board certified in management of cholesterol. And I stopped one of his cholesterol medicines. I, I reduced the dose of his statin by 75%. And, but what blew me away is this man said within a week of changing my diet from a standard American diet, SAD, by the way, sad. <laughs> sad. <laughs> to, to a whole food plant based diet, you know, with minimal, with no added oil, no added salt, no added sugar. He went all in, both feet, very motivated. He said, within a week of changing my diet, I have not used a single nitroglycerin. And I've been walking on a treadmill for 30 minutes a day at some speed and some incline that I can no longer recall. But we both just sort of sat there and he said, I have to say you changed my life. And I, 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 I thought, boy, I think you've changed mine. And so that, that was my epiphany when I thought there's nothing that I could, I told him that there, there's nothing that I was trained to offer you from either a pills or procedure standpoint 
that would have had this dramatic an impact on your symptoms. And it was a, a real weird feeling for me. Part excitement, part disappointment. You know, how did I not know this? So that sort of got me excited about learning more about it, which led to facilitating a program called CHIP, the Complete Health Improvement Program, where I continually heard patients, again, edging them toward a whole food plant-based diet. I continually heard patients say, this is the best I've ever felt, which is not what I was hearing in my cardiology clinic. I was hearing, you know, I'm having side effects of this and that medication and what can we do? And I also heard from them, why has my doctor never told me this before, which was a bit of a challenge to me to really try to understand this better, learn this more and figure out, you know, what, what is this all about? So I, I did an experiment on a very important person, myself, <laughs> for a month. I said, you know, I'm just going to go all in for a month. I can do it for a month. I'm just going to see what happens. Uh, I, I adopted this whole food, plant-based, no added oil diet. And I lost about six pounds, uh, which was good, you know, not critical, but it was interesting. Knowing what I know about you, you were probably in pretty good shape before you made this change in diet, right? Yeah, right. I, mean, I was. I mean, I thought I was. I mean, I, you know, I'm no Olympic level athlete, but I was exercising regularly and trying to eat what I thought was a healthy diet. So there was a change. I mean, it, this was a change for me. Um, I remember being in the physician's lounge and, you know, trying to decide which salad dressing I could eat if I was going to do this. And it ended up just being plain balsamic vinegar because that's really all I had. And I didn't have time to think about what else can I do to doctor this up and make it better. <laughs> um, and my cholesterol dropped 45% in 30 days. My LDL, my bad cholesterol, which was 130. We used to get it checked all the time at doctor's day. Um, we don't do that anymore. Uh, dropped to 70 in 30 days. Wow. So the 50th percentile in the US to the fifth percentile in the US. And I thought, man, you know, as a lipidologist, I thought this is the sort of drop that we would see with high dose statins, you know, things like high dose Lipitor, you know, Crestor, Torvastatin, Resuvastatin. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it just took off from there. And then I became the medical director of the Ornish program and, and ultimately left my practice because I felt like I just needed to do something else. What's the Ornish program? Can you give us yeah, a they're, brief... They're, they're, Brief, uh, there were two doctors uh, at the time who were doing work unbeknownst to each other, which is kind of interesting. Uh, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn at the Cleveland Clinic, who uh, he wrote the book that I mentioned. And the other was Dean Ornish, who was in California, uh, who started a program called the Ornish Lifestyle Medicine Program, which Mission Hospital here in Asheville uh, had from 2016 to the end of 2020. Uh, we now have a different intensive cardiovascular rehab program called Pritikin, the Pritikin program. Some listeners may be familiar with the Pritikin Center in Miami, same, same organization. Again, a lifestyle medicine program. And Ornish and Esselstyn both showed that you can, by changing the way people eat, and Ornish also added physical activity, stress management, which is, I think, particularly important these days in the, as we're still through, going through this pandemic, and group support, which I we can talk more about too if we have time, which I think is really critical. Uh, those patients actually followed along for a period of three and a half to five years, had less cholesterol buildup in their arteries after some years than they did previous to entering the program and had better outcomes and better reduction than patients who were treated again with optimal medical therapy which is what I had been doing up until that to that epiphany moment. Yeah, yeah, very good. So, what changes did you see? Did you feel different after you made your changes in your personal lifestyle? Yeah, that's a great question. I I did. Um, I felt. I guess the biggest change that I personally noted was um, I felt mentally more alert. I, I didn't have the afternoon sort of crash um, where I felt like I needed a cup of coffee, you know, about two, two, yeah. one to three, somewhere in that range. Right. I needed something to kind of get me back to that morning mentality where I felt like I was on it. Yeah. Um, I didn't feel that as much when I was eating, you know, a cleaner diet. 
how old are you? I'm 54. When did you go plant-based? How many years ago? I was about 46. Okay. And the original patient, how old was he? He was probably in his late 60s, 60, hmm. 65 to 70. Okay. And, and was he overweight? He was. So he, in general, wasn't healthy. Like he wasn't like slight and then had a bad heart. Overweight, cholesterol problems, blood pressure problems, cardiovascular disease on a bunch of medications. So he was never doing any exercise anyway. His I don't heart know. would not allow it or would yeah, not well, support I, it. At the time that he saw me, that's correct. He was not able to do it. He, he just have chest pain walking the dog. And it was, he was tearful in the office about it. We talk a lot on the podcast about the power of eating more fresh fruits and vegetables to improve your health. And because that's our focus, uh, we pretty much stick to that. But there's more to what you're prescribing for your patients now. And it's really a change in lifestyle. I mentioned this fairly new, I suppose maybe just the terminology is new, but lifestyle medicine. You were the very first board certified physician in the world in lifestyle medicine. That's correct? I have certificate number one. You know, we, it was interesting. We were at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine meeting in October of 17, 2017. And uh, Stefan Herzog, who's, who's started the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine, I knew him from chip training. He's kind of a real personality. Uh, he's, running through the crowd shouting, number one, number one. I'm like, what in the world are you doing? And he's getting closer and closer to me. And, and ultimately, I realized he was talking to me. And I thought, what What are you talking about, man? Good to see you again, by the way. And he said, um, you were the first person in the world to register for the for this exam. And I, you know, I just happened to be on email, I guess, when I saw the email and said, sure, I'll do it. So he said, no pressure, but you better pass this test. You know, so <laughs> there were about 200 people who um, we all took the test together. So technically we all passed at the same time, but I got certificate number one because I had registered first. You registered. I'm actually, first. I'm looking at, at, at um, Michael Greger's book, How Not to Die right here in, on my little bookcase. And Michael said, <laughs> a lot of people may know Michael because of nutritionfacts.org. And he's also this writer of these books, How Not to Die, How Not to Die It. He's just done so much in this space. He sat directly in front of me and I told him, I said, Hey, I'm glad you're sitting there because, you know, if I get stuck on a question, I'm just going to look over your shoulder. <laughs> I know you know the answer. So there's cheating in, in med school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Turns out I couldn't see it very well anyway. And uh, it was a fair test. It was hard. I mean, you had to, you had to have prepared for it. Um, yeah. What yeah, kind was, of, uh, how long does it take to go through that program and get certified? Is it um, The training, the studying uh, probably took, you know, 40, 50 hours total. Yeah. Um, did you have to have certain qualifications first? I mean, yes. did you have to, you have to be a physician before no. You can, no. Okay. So there is a, you can be a diplomat of the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine. You have to be a physician uh, to be able to take to get that certification. Yeah. And you can be a um, and I'd have to look back at the details, but you can be a nurse, physical therapist, uh, other other health coach to take dietitian, to, dietitian, dietitian uh, to take probably. a different exam. You get a different certification oh, okay. instead of it being from the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine. It's from the American College of Lifestyle right, Medicine. But right. you know, very similar test and certainly a very similar training. Yeah, we interact with uh, a lot of dietitians, so I was yeah, curious exactly. about from that perspective. When a person begins to change their lifestyle in this dramatic way, do you actually see a reduction of plaque in the arteries? Does it go away? Yeah, that's a great question. Ornish, to go back to his data, because I think this helps to understand it some, he did a heart cath, diagnostic angiography, where we squirt the dye in the heart arteries and take x-ray pictures of people at the beginning of this randomization. And there was about a 40% blockage in their heart arteries on average. And then they were randomized to one of two treatment strategies. One was optimal medical therapy, aspirin, anti-anginal medical therapy, things like your, your audience may be familiar with some of these uh, beta blockers, metoprolol, uh, any OLs, atenolol, propranolol, uh, statins. Only about 60% of patients were on statins in that study because that was in around 1990. 
Today, it would be about 98% of patients would be on statins mm. because they had coronary artery disease, cholesterol buildup, or you were randomized to no medications and to the Ornish program, which weighted four things equally heavily. Nutrition, whole food plant-based diet with rare exceptions. He allowed egg whites and no fat dairy. Uh, physical activity slash exercise. We try not to use the word exercise because it's sort of a four letter word for some. <laughs> Rest management, which was Hatha yoga and meditation and group support. The group support piece, interestingly, was the piece that I was as the medical director of the program, not invited to. I could participate in all three of the other pillars, but not in group support. In group support, you sat with a, with a licensed clinical social worker or clinical psychologist, and you talked about how this cardiovascular diagnosis, the heart attack, the stent, the bypass surgery, in many cases, the resuscitation from sudden cardiac death affected you mentally, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. So and this is like the mind, body, spirit approach yes, with it? Yes. It was what happened, what was said in group stayed in group. It was a very closed group. And interestingly, by the way, what I heard on exit interviews from the program was that it was that that group support piece, that social connection piece, that was the most valuable piece of the program, which allowed, it sort of served as the glue, if you will, to allow those other pillars, the stress management, the exercise, and the nutrition to take root. And, and I, I get it. I, I didn't expect that. I was surprised by that, uh, but in, very interested in that. So he anyway, he divided those people into two groups and he followed them for a year. And every, at the end of a year, everyone got another heart cath. And there was some slight separation of those curves, Teresa, to answer your question, some slight progression of cholesterol blockage in the medical therapy group and some slight regression in the Ornish group. But people said, well, that's, it's a very small separation. You know, we're not impressed. So Ornish said, okay, so we'll go out to five years and do another one. So at five years, they did another heart catheterization. In the medical therapy group, there was about a 28% progression of cholesterol buildup. They had 28% more cholesterol buildup in their heart arteries. In the Ornish group, no medications, there was about an 8% regression. And so he sort of coined the term then cardiovascular disease reversal because at five years, there's less cholesterol buildup in your arteries. Now I told patients as a clinical cardiologist, while I think that's interesting, fascinating, um, I'm really not so interested in whether or not you have a 40% or a 35% blockage in your heart arteries. What I'm interested in is are you have, is it interrupting your quality of life, i.e., is it having, is it causing you to have exertional chest pain like my patient that I shared with you, Angina? And, or is it going to cut short your life because a third of all heart attacks are fatal and the most common presenting symptom of symptomatic heart disease is sudden cardiac death, which is a big problem. So when you look at that data, that's what really blew me away. The, my patient's experience was not atypical. When you look at the Ornish data compared to medical to optimal medical therapy, medical therapy patients had 165% more angina at five years, despite being on anti-anginal medical therapy. The Ornish group had a 90% improvement in angina or relief of angina after five years, despite being on no anti-anginal medical therapy. And the medical therapy group was two and a half times more likely to have a significant cardiovascular event compared to the Ornish group. The reduction in cholesterol, by the way, between the two groups was about the same. It was about 20%. Again, only about 60% of patients were on statins in the medical therapy group at the time. But they had about 20% reduction in cholesterol in both groups, yet the Ornish group had better relief, far better relief of chest pain and fewer cardiovascular events. The thing that impresses me about what I've learned from you and, and even what you're saying today, especially what you're saying today, is that you're talking about a holistic approach to life and living. And that whole term holistic uh, has been around for a long time. And it's gotten a bit of a bad name, I think, especially from the medical community. I think, look, well, they're kind of quacks. They're not always, they're not always people who are well-trained and know what they're talking about. But what you've been involved in is very evidence-based. Uh, you're not just, you're not 
you're not faking it. You're, you're not just, you know, these aren't just, oh, I believe this is going to help. You're looking at evidence and data. And I respect that. I think that's important. I, am I correct about that? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned it. I, I, I don't think we can, I don't like to use the word compete, but I, I want almost, I am going to say, I don't, I don't think we can compete in this space with pharma, with pharma, big pharma, big food. Uh, with all this trial data that they have, we want to practice evidence-based medicine. And, and that's important to note that, as you did, that, that this is all, lifestyle medicine is about evidence-based uh, medical treatments that they work, uh, right. that are published in peer-reviewed journals. So it's the same, you know, we got to even the playing field. Yeah. How many people would you estimate that you have worked with and had success with your program, just approximately? Yeah. The Ornish program in Asheville, and the, with the Ornish program, we had, I'd say, probably in the range of 350, 400 graduates in that program. Pritikin program, which we just started, you know, similar, just started a month ago, is not now our default program. The Ornish program, you had to elect to be a part of. You chose to go into Ornish, which was a very different experience than traditional cardiac rehab, which is an exercise-only program. And so you either chose Ornish or you did traditional cardiac rehab, which was an exercise program. Now, Pritikin, which is a different intensive cardiovascular rehab program, is our default program. So you don't choose. If you do cardiac rehab at Mission Hospital, you do Pritikin. So I, I'm excited about that opportunity. It is interesting because with Ornish, there was a selection bias. People who chose that were ready to go, mentally ready. You can imagine that might not be the case with the program that people just they don't get to choose. They, if they're going to do cardiac rehab, you do Pritikin. So some of these people are going to be really motivated to make change and some are not. And, and that's, that's life. I mean, that's real life. So I'd say in eight years of practicing this style of medicine, I became known for this sort of style of practice, you know, as word sort of got out word of mouth that, Hey, this guy was willing to talk to you about a different approach. I say, I probably also in, in eight years, probably treated another several hundred I think lifestyle medicine is sort of having its moment. I mean, I think it's it's people are understanding that we can't continue on the path that we're on. You know, we spent three point four trillion dollars uh, a year on on medical therapy on 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 health care, which is really sick care. You know, as, as Edwin said, it's not health care; it's a sick care strategy, and it's it is exceedingly expensive. It's very inefficient. I mean, I, I don't think anybody who's been through as has been a patient would say, wow, that's a well-oiled machine. <laughs> and, and then frankly, at least when, when it comes to treating chronic diseases, things like obesity, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, dementia, diabetes, cholesterol, blood pressure, you know, the list goes on and on. It's, um, it's relatively ineffective. You say you left your cardiology practice, but you didn't leave your patients. You were still there serving them with this, these changes in lifestyle. Yeah, I left August 20. I left my practice January 21. I was rehired as the medical director of the uh, cardiac rehab program. In fact, I was there this morning with a student from UNC Asheville who's sort of shadowing and excited about learning about this. So yeah, I miss the people. It's, it's really comes out of that group support piece. You know, it's, it's all about the people, the patients, the colleagues. And I, I, I believe that because People understand that this is an expensive system that isn't working for them. It doesn't work for the patients or the providers. The providers are burnt out and tired of knowing that, you know, tweaking the statins just not really, it's, re, it's not helping. It's a Band-Aid approach. And they know it, whether or not they admit it to themselves or not. They know that that is just not really moving the needle. And so I think that calls all these factors. And I think the pandemic in some ways has, has helped us with that. You know, what am I doing with my life feeling? You know, a lot of people are exiting the workforce for better force. Um, I think that people are really questioning what they're doing and why, and am I living according to my purpose? And I think that lifestyle medicine is um, jumping on people's radars as uh, something that just in intuitively makes sense. And like you said, is evidence-based. And as we get that education out there, then they're saying, okay, now what? Now, how do I do it? It's not about what you know when it comes to lifestyle medicine. We can right. know. We all know to eat better. We know to move more. We know we're stressed out. We got to do something about it. The key is having some sort of structure around it to enable us to, to practice those behaviors so that they become, 
our new health habits. With your Pritikin program at the hospital in Asheville, are you doing both components, the diet and the exercise? Is that all? Are they getting the lectures, things like that, yeah. like they would at the Pritikin Center? Yeah, another good question. So the way this program is structured, there's 72 hours of instruction, of, of participation. 36 hours are exercise and 36 hours are other. There's, there's nutrition training. The three pillars are nutrition training, physical activity slash exercise, and healthy mindset, which goes a little bit into the, the stress management piece as well. And in those 36 non-exercise hours, we sort of divided it, cut it three ways. There are videos that are related to all of those domains that people watch, 12 hours. There are 12 hours worth of, of instruction from one of our very talented team, licensed clinical social worker, health coach, registered dietitian, exercise physiologist. And there's 12 hours. My favorite part, frankly, is what I was participating in this morning is our, um, our teaching kitchen, our cooking session, where we have a staff member get up in front of the people. And today we we're talking about salads and dressings. Tomorrow, Next week, we'll be talking about something else, maybe entrees. And you get to see how to make this practical. How do I, how do I incorporate this into my life. Is that only open to cardiac patients there or yes. can someone else sign up for it? Yes, you, you qualify for cardiac rehab by having a cardiovascular event, heart attack, uh, yeah. bypass stent, transplant. Right. And so, insurance covers that? For we do for those diagnoses, yes. Now you can technically, you can pay out of pocket for that program. You can pay out of pocket for the owner's program. It's uh, that the 72 hours if you were going to pay would be in the $7,500 range. Mm, so. so therein lies the problem in terms of if somebody has some crummy insurance, it's going to be the haves and the have not unless somebody's terribly ill. So you did say it does ripple into different conditions. Is cancer one of them that comes across your desk? Now, lifestyle medicine which by the way is six domains and that they recognize in lifestyle medicine. It's healthy nutrition, predominantly whole plant-based foods, physical activity, stress management, sleep health, which we haven't talked about, but is important. If you don't sleep well, you don't have the energy to bring to bear on these other domains. Um, Toxin avoidance, smoking cessation, risky alcohol use, opioids, um, different environmental toxins. Uh, And then that critical piece, that social connection piece and ruckus health has added a seventh pillar, uh, which is purpose. So lifestyle medicine addresses all of those chronic diseases, including cancer. Cardiovascular rehab is for cardiovascular diagnoses. There's not a cancer rehab program uh, that I'm aware of that is paid by insurance. I think that's an opportunity that is ripe. Uh, And as you also alluded to, you know, we're talking about rehab. I, I, I am more interested in prehab. So I, 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 chose CHIP initially as our program. Uh, and I saw it, frankly, I saw it as a cardiovascular prehab program or a cancer prehab program. Can you I've remind us what CHIP stands for? The Complete Health Improvement Project okay. program. You, yeah. you yeah. also mentioned that the, uh, the group session was maybe more important because if it's the pillars, you need all, all of them to be uh, stable. But um, is it, it kind of sounds like an AA type program that like what stays in there, you know, what's said in there stays in there. Why do you think that it's so vital? I think it's critical for a number of reasons. I think that's an outstanding question. I believe it's about ultimately in order to make changes that you need to make in your life, you have to uh, be vulnerable and you have to have some circle of trust. You have to have some support network. It is very, very difficult to go this alone. It is hard to make changes in your life, whether it comes to eating or moving more, managing stress or whatever it is, unless your environment supports those changes. And I think that, you know, it's that group support piece is that's that's your group that those are your people who you know have your back and know you and trust you and and that's how you form relationships right as you lasting relationships you have to be vulnerable in that relationship and so there was a lot of stuff shared in that group support piece with the Ornish again that I wasn't privy to directly 
that, um, you know, fostered those sort of relationships and kind of speaks to the whole blue zones idea. You know, I don't, I don't know if your listeners will be familiar with the blue zones. They They may not be. Uh, Yeah. Why don't you just give a brief. Yeah. It's really interesting. Dan Buettner arguably has the best job in the world. I was a a writer for, or a photographer too, for uh, National Geographic and traveled the world and got paid to do it. And, and identified these five places in the world with the, 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 highest number of centenarians, 100 year old people who were not just 100 years old, but thriving. And one of them happens to be in, in the United States in Loma Linda, California, uh, where the Seventh Day Adventists live and they, they eat more of a plant based diet. And they're more active than, than standard American population. Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica, Sardinia in Italy, Icaria, Greece and um, Okinawa, Japan. And one of, he, he asked himself the question, what is it about these people that allow, are they doing something different that allows them to be thriving at an older age? And one of the things that he identified was, was that they had a group, they had a support group. They had what in Japan, they call them MOAI, M-O-A-I. This is my group that I'm raised with, that I know I can share everything about myself and my life with. And the idea of the blue zones is willpower to make these changes is an exhausting and exhaustible uh, uh, resource. And, and you really can't make these changes successfully unless your environment supports those changes. So, you know, as we go through group support, we're creating our little environment, our micro environment. As we all try to do this together, y- you, Produce Buzz and Ruckus and, and everyone else, Blue Zones, everyone else in this space, what we're ultimately trying to do is create societal change that allows the healthy choice to be the easy choice so that I don't have to, I don't feel like I'm trying anymore. I'm not swimming upstream as I try to eat more fruits and vegetables. I, I'm eating more fruits and vegetables because that's what everybody in my community does. And, and it's the easier choice. And instead of you know, switching out the fruit cup for the waffle fries for an extra 79 cents, the waffle fries are 79 cents more than the fruit cup. I mean, those sort of things, right. you know, it's, um, it takes time and, I, and I'm realistic about it, but I think Cynthia, that, that speaks to, um, you know, your question about why does that group support? Why is it so necessary? Yeah. Well, I had a, a neurologist that left clinical medicine to go into a different position. I have chronic migraines and he always did the mind, body, spirit. So he was on me about, you know, are you meditating? He wasn't proud of most of his profession. A select group understood or bought into the mind, body, spirit. I think that the camaraderie of AA is just sometimes truly life-changing. I just didn't know if it was that connection. I think it is. I mean, I think it's that there's a spiritual component to AA as well. It goes back to being vulnerable again. Tell us about how your, how Ruckus is structured and what you're doing with Ruckus. What we really want to do is help transform the system, which seems impossibly uh, an impossibly large task from a sick care system to a healthcare system. We believe that the way to do that, that, that first, that this is founded on a, a relationship, an authentic relationship with a provider who, who can care, really care for you and get to know you, that relationship piece again, that vulnerability piece. I believe that that is best done in a direct primary care type relationship. You need access to a provider that's missing today. You need time with that doctor, which is definitely missing today your doctor doesn't have time to talk about all this stuff about lifestyle medicine, barely has time to write a prescription. And then that foundation of knowledge, that foundation of care has to be lifestyle medicine. And then things that can restore physiology, natural treatments like physical therapy, and then ultimately pills and procedures. So I'm not saying that pills and procedures can't be used in this model. They're just the apex of the pyramid and lifestyle medicine has to be the foundation and that it is team-based approach. The provider can't be the only person supporting this health journey for you. You have to have access to the dietitians, the health coaches, the exercise physiologists, the whoever else you need, the mental health specialist, smoking cessation counselor. 
you have to have access to a team of people who can support that. So I believe that that's the foundation. And then I believe that that what Ruckus can do then on top of that foundation is provide access to serve as a connector to provide access to those to a larger team to really transition things to a community that will support the healthy choice. So again, that the healthy choice is the easy choice. So a little bit of a blue zones idea. We're trying to teach people to do their marketing on the outside and and leave the center aisles of the grocery store alone. I really love what you do. And isn't that unfortunate that the healthcare industry as a whole doesn't at least recognize this and then they can start uh, making modifications, but it's, it would be nice to be in a community, but I, how do you make that rippling effect? Teresa lives in Plymouth. Teresa, you know, like we can have dinner a couple times a year, but <laughs> you I, know, I, like, I see all that as opportunity and I'm with you. I mean, I, I, I'm not, just a glasses half full guy all the time. I mean, I have my moments too, where I'm like, you know, we're never going to get this done. How are we going to do this? I think the answer, the answer that comes to me, how are we going to do this is we just have to get started. I mean, you can't, you have to start somewhere. You know, Seth Godin said, you know, ship the work. We have to, you have to do the work without being attached to the outcome. We have to just start and you can't, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. I mean, you, you know, you ask the guy, What are you working on while I'm building a wall? What are you working on? I'm building a house. What are you working on while I'm building a cathedral? And you have to start with something. So um, I don't know if we'll be successful. I I hope we will be, but I think there's a major opportunity. And if we ruckus in this instance, if we end up not being able to build this, but we maybe our job is to to inspire someone else to build it. I I don't know, but... Mm -hmm. I just think there's opportunities and I think we all have to individually ask ourselves, how do I contribute to this? What, what do I bring to this cause? And as we continue to put out podcasts like this and, you know, you reach a hundred people, you don't have to, to turn a thousand cattle, as Susan would say, all you have to do is convince 10, you know, and those 10 will, will turn the herd. So we don't have to convince the herd. We just have to convince, you know, one or two cows and let's go. You say whole food plant-based what is there a difference between just plant-based? Yeah. Well, yeah, that term gets tossed around a lot. And when I say that, I mean, um, I like, uh, uh, the, the quote, eat food, not too much, mostly plants eat real food. And then I'm talking about food that your great, great grandmother, Michael Pollan said this would recognize as food. They're not, not junk food. There are a lot of reasons that people can decide to give up animal products, and, and you can be an ethical vegan, for example, but you can be a junk food vegan. I mean, if you're eating, and this, this data has been published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, actually, uh, in 2017, 2018, the, the cardiovascular risk from eating a junk food vegan diet, for example, a jelly donut and Coke for breakfast. <laughs> no, that's people- hey, 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 be nice, be nice. <laughs> oh processed sugar, oil, and salt, in fact. And in that those outcomes are worse than the animal-based diet. And so that when we're talking about improving health outcomes, I'm talking about eating whole plant-based foods, things that are as close to as they are found in nature as possible. I like Michael Greger's definition of process being nothing good is taken out and nothing bad is added. Mm-hmm. So an apple is better than applesauce, is better than apple juice, is better than apple pie sort of ideas. So, you know, when I say whole food plant-based, I mean with the the way it was found in nature, with the water, with the fiber, with the skins, with the seeds, mm. you know, <laughs> tomato, cucumber salad, and and we added a little bit of vinegar and some apple juice concentrate, and nothing bad was removed from that. That's a whole food plant-based yeah. dish. Right. I can't forget the holy trinity of salt, sugar, and uh, fat. Yeah. <laughs> salt, oil, sugar, SOS. SOS, yeah. <laughs> Tater chips are plant based, right? But that's right, probably right. one of the worst things uh, you can put in your body. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So I think that's. Important. I would like to make uh, one comment that 
I've, I've uh, researched and studied a lot of the different successful doctors who have had lifestyle, lifestyle management diets. And uh, one thing that I've found that they, they all have in common is elimination of refined sugar and simple carbohydrates. Yeah, I think if there was one thing that I would get rid of in our diets, uh, one, and I only had to, I could only choose one, it would be sugar. Oh, sorry. My I, God. Know it's, I mean, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm as human as you are. And uh, I, I, I baked a cake this morning. Now I do everything from scratch, not everything, but most of my things. She I baked me some scratch. really delicious scratch. cookies for Christmas. Yeah, well, yeah, you're out on the cookies, you're out on the bread, forget it. I'm sending you nothing. Yeah. But, you need a support group, Cynthia. We're going to be your support group. <laughs> you know what? Talk about like a an alcoholic. Like I, I'm hi. I'm Cynthia, and I'm addicted to sugar. You're supposed to say hi, Cynthia. Oh, hi, Cynthia. <laughs> How long have you been off sugar? <laughs> Five seconds. <laughs> exactly. You know, you know, and it it takes about. It takes weeks for that to go away. I mean, it, it's everybody changes in a different way, right? Do I wean off of this sugar or do I just go cold turkey off of this? I, I'll tell you, and this is this is authentic, but not what you want to hear. I successfully did this um, several years ago, weaned myself off sugar and didn't want it anymore. And then thought, I did it. I made it. I conquered this demon. And then I said, well, now that I've gotten so good at this, I'm just going to have this brownie or this cookie. I can't remember what it was. Oh my God. It was like a, it was, it was like a drug addiction. It was back on and starting all over, man. So, you wow. know, I don't, I don't, I think perfection is too high a standard for us. And I'm a perfectionist. I'm a recovering perfectionist. <laughs> and, and I really, and, and I, I failed multiple times in the past when I've set myself the standard being perfection in this area whatever the area is. And, and I know I can't really do that to myself or I'm not going to succeed. So I can't set perfection as this, as the goal. I just have to say, don't let good perfect be the enemy of good. So I, I just, you know, just do it when you can and do the best you can and don't beat yourself up about it when you fall down and brush yourself off and say, okay, I'm going to try it again. First of all, once you change your pantry, it's easier, but Beans and beans and lentils and lentils. Like I needed something more. You know, I can't eat, you know, lentils six days a week. Yeah, I think we all get sort of, and I, I do too, can get sort of in a rut, you know, cooking certain things. I, I'm the cook at my house and I, I guarantee you that my family would say, oh yeah, dad can go on a little lentil craze for a while and <laughs> nothing else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's easy. And, but, and then you think on the flip side, the people who aren't eating healthy, they're eating the same 20 things in a rotation too. I mean, yeah, yeah. You have your go-tos. Right. You know, you have your go-tos. I think we all have our go-tos. I think there's definitely an opportunity for, for us to um, collaboratively and not competitively uh, put our heads together and figure out how we can push these different recipes out to people and say, you know, I think this based on your, and they're already working on this. We have a friend who's working on this without going too much in detail there. It learns what you like and it suggests other recipes based on what you like. You might also want to choose this, which uses lentils in a different way or uses a different bean or uses you know, tofu or tempeh or edamame or some, something um, and changes one little thing at a time so that you're not abandoning the whole flavor profile that you love, but mm -hmm. you're switching it up a little bit. And then after a while, you've you know, after six months of that, you, you were way over here and now you're way over here, something totally different, but it led you down this interesting discovery path. I, I, I think there's a major opportunity to do something like that. And, and if you want to do that with me, then um, let's talk. Do you do white, white, white rice? I use brown rice in my cooking or wild and rice. potatoes. And so anything like veg is good. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, if it's a whole food, it, yes. Yeah, I don't yeah, potatoes either. have gotten a bad rap. They're actually, you know, depending on the type of potato, but most oh, all potatoes are loaded with uh, vitamins yeah. and nutrients. Yeah, but it's don't the they, stuff we they put just, on them. Well, makes. even if you uh, didn't put the good stuff on it, no kidding, um, it would still hit your bloodstream and turn to sugar, right? 
you know, everything is we most, when you talk about a whole food plant-based diet, it's about 80% carbohydrates. I, I think, you know, there's been so much in the literature about low carb, low fat, high carb, high fat, high protein, low protein. You know, we, there are only three macronutrients, there's carbs, protein, and fat. And so we need to sort of get away from the idea that, that this macronutrient or that macronutrient is bad or good for us. Carbohydrate, it depends what type of carbohydrate are you eating? You know, is it a, is it, is it a potato or is it a potato chip? Is it um, animal protein or plant protein? Is it, you know, is it fat from avocado? Is it fat from, you know, lard? So they're very different and their effects on the diet are very different. And, and there is something called glycemic index and, you know, that you can convert different foods to blood sugar, glucose in different uh, more qu quickly or less quickly, depending on the glycemic index. So yes, potatoes might be converted to blood glucose uh, in carrots uh, more quickly than non-starchy vegetables, mm -hmm. you know, uh, broccoli or zucchini or something. Um, but they're all good and they're all part of a, it, the key here, as you hit on with the, you know, we get in these ruts is diversity. You know, as long as you're not, you, I, you wouldn't do very well if all you ate was potatoes, but I would point out that in Okinawa, Japan, the staple in their diet is a purple sweet potato and they're in the blue zones and you, we're not. Yeah. So, you know, we need to pay attention to whole diets, not, not, individual things in our diet, but the whole diet, are you eating all the colors? Are you eating, you know, the visible spectrum, are you eating the reds and the yellows and the carotenoids there and the greens from the chlorophylls and the blues and the indigos and the violets, the purples from the anthocyanins. And, and we can, I, you know, I don't like to get mired down in the science, but eat the color of the rainbow, eat a diverse whole food plant-based diet. If you 90% or more of your calories should be coming from plant-based sources. If you, it depends on where you are. If you want to, if you're in prehab, 90% may be good enough. Yeah. If you're in cardiac rehab and you're having angina walking the dog and taking five nitro a day, you might want to go all in here, man. Uh, so. Well, that's anyway. a, that's a, that's a good way to end it. I think we've probably taken too much of your time already. Yeah, but, I love but talking about this. Stuff. That's great. <laughs> I will ask you this. What are your favorite fruits and veggies? Um, you like them all probably. I, I, I do. You know, I, I'm, I like more of them than I did when I was a kid. <laughs> I didn't like beets when I was a kid because a canned beet was kind of my vision of beet. Yeah. And it still has very little appeal to me. A canned beet, I will add it to a salad, but man, a roasted beet now. I oh my gosh. Yeah. Beet. Oh yeah. gosh. Man. Yeah. Um, I, I tried, I think if I had to choose my two favorites, I would say greens and beans, greens and legumes. Uh, I love uh, Tuscan, uh, dinosaur kale. Hmm. I love the feel of it. I love the taste of it. I love the depth of the green of it. Uh, I put it in smoothies. I make salads out of it. I love it. Uh, it's really hard to find right now in the grocery store. With I the... don't think I've heard of that variety. Oh man. Dinosaur, I... Tuscan dinosaur or dinosaur Tuscan? It's called different Lancinato kale. Lancinato. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Lancinato. It's, it's, there are different types of kale and it's my favorite right. type of kale. Yeah. I just like the mouthfeel of it. Um, is it and purple? Eat, There's purple kale out there too. And there is purple kale. I, it's a leafier green kale right. that I don't, I don't enjoy it as much. I like it, but I don't like it in a salad as much as I do that, that Lancinato or dinosaur yeah. type, same thing. Right. Um, I, I eat beans all the time. I love beans and everything, you right. know, chilies and, um, oh gosh. I mean, I just eat beans, greens and beans. I try to get those every day. Yep. Did you celebrate National Bean Day? That was January sixth. <laughs> I did. I did unknowingly. I didn't know it was National Bean Day, but I, I feel sure that I did. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And what yeah. about fruit? Like, what is your? Uh, you mentioned veg. Did I? Did I miss the fruit? No, I fruit. I I eat my breakfast in the winter. I, I'm sort of a creature of habit. I sort of have two breakfasts. Um, in the summer, I drink a green smoothie. Uh, in the winter, colder weather, I, I, I like a hot breakfast. So I have oatmeal with always a banana, whole banana to sweeten it, uh, half an apple, and then a handful of Wyman's triple berry blend, <laughs> uh, a handful of, of, of frozen um, berries to sort of cool it off. 
so that I can, plus I like berries and plus, you know, it's not. Oh, option. so you put them in, you don't thaw them first. You just, throw I the put them in there berries. and let it be a natural. Oh, that's a good cooler. idea. Yeah. yeah. And, um, it doesn't fit sort of in the bowl very well. Sometimes <laughs> there can be some boil over in when I nuke yeah, the, you know, uh, Dr. Asmel, you can get a bigger bowl. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's a store just down the street from See, here. and what I have for breakfast, I love to make, and then you just grab them and go yeah. because Overnight. I love that oatmeal. <laughs> um, so my, I love, I love fruits, but apple, banana, and berries would be my top three that I eat most. Yeah. Do you eat nuts at all? I eat a ton. Of you, okay, I, I noticed eat, in you know. Essel, Esselstyn's uh, cookbook, I was looking through that, and they. They said eliminate all oil, including nuts. Yeah, so, no, yeah. I, I'm glad you mentioned that at the end. I thought we had dodged that, Teresa. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can edit know, it out. No. <laughs> the, data, the data show that people who eat nuts uh, have a lower incidence of cardiovascular disease. Um, there is a high fat content in, in, in nuts. Um, and, you know, I... I and Ornish says the same thing. Ornish has limits around the amount of nuts because of the amount of fat in the diet. You can have one walnut. You can have four pistachios. You can have six almonds. I, yeah, I'd have to look at the science again and have you really convince me that that's the right thing to do because I, I sometimes feel like I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know, and, and I don't want to make it so hard that people say, seriously, one walnut, I'm going crazy today and having too. So, you know, it, it is a high fat thing too, which is my problem. I mean, I eat peanuts are my, my, my go-to snack lately. And I've actually gained six pounds, uh, during this pandemic and haven't lost it yet because I still am in this habit of going down and then I'm handicapped by the fact that I have a 16 year old son at home who's just hitting his growth spurt and could eat anything all day long and not gain any weight. <laughs> So right. we have peanuts everywhere because it's his favorite snack. It's, it's your environment again, right? So I, my environment is there's peanuts calling me all the time. And I have a handful of peanuts four times a day. And that, that's not a low calorie option. Again, it's how you change. Do I, can I, do I do two handfuls instead of four handfuls of nuts a day? Or do I know myself and think that it's like potato chips, right? I can't, I can't just eat one. I just have to not eat any for a while until I've gotten back to where I want to be. And then... The yeah. COVID-19 pounds are awful. Oh, true. It's real. My whole life, never watched my weight. And now at this age, I'm like. I hear you. You know, I left my job during the middle of a pandemic and now I'm home. And now, I, I mean, when you're busy at work, you don't have time to eat. You know, you're hungry. And if you were at home, you definitely eat. But you can't. You have four more patients to see for lunch. And here, you're like, I'm not even hungry. I mean, you know, why am I looking in the fridge? Because I don't know, there may be something there that wants me to eat it. You know, so it's, it's no, I learned how to bake bread. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was, that was a tough one. Good luck. It's good bread too. She sent me some of it. <laughs> bet, right. Well, listen, we need to let you go. I know you've got other things to do today, but it's been really real pleasure. Thank you for coming in and sharing your story and encouraging our listeners to change their lifestyle and maybe a little baby steps at a time, which I think that's the key. One of the key things that uh, they'll take away from this today. Just start, as you said, just get started. So, and eat more fresh fruits and vegetables. Yes, you're, you've been fascinating. Thank you. It's a lot. I appreciate the opportunity and congratulate you guys on doing what you're doing. Great, thank you. Thank you. All right. We were so fortunate to have Dr. Asbill on the show today. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. And we hope it inspires you to not only get more fresh fruits and vegetables in your diet, but to consider all aspects of a healthy lifestyle. You can learn more about Dr. Asbill and his work at ruckushealth.co. That's R-U-C-K-U-S-H-E-A-L-T-H dot co. Not dot com, but dot co. Ruckushealth.co. Please check it out and connect with them there. And... Please take a second before you leave to subscribe and or follow our podcast on whatever podcast platform you are listening on. We are on over 10 different podcast feeds, including YouTube. And if you want to help support this podcast by making a donation, we would be so grateful. Just go to anchor.fm forward slash produce hyphen buzz 
and you will see a support button below the podcast description. Click on it, give what you can, no amount is too small, and, of course, no amount is too large. Thank you, listeners, and good night. Well, thank you, listeners, for tuning in to the Produce Buzzers podcast. Brought to you by Produce Buzz, the gathering place for lovers of fresh fruits and veggies. We hope you were entertained a bit and educated a lot about fresh produce. Be sure to join us next time, and please tell your friends to do so as well. Like, share, and comment on our Produce Buzz Facebook page. And check out our website at www.producebuzz.com. There you will find articles about fresh fruits and veggies, how to select, store, and prepare them, as well as lots of interesting facts about all the wonderful bounty the earth provides for us. Until next time, be fruitful, and don't forget to veg out. Oh,